<laughs> I'm going to try to do a brief. Now, I think my clock is right. If you have to leave, whenever you have to leave, you leave. I'm going to try to preach for just 30 minutes. Now, I'm going to try to cover seven verses in the book of Jude. Uh, we're going to be going about 500 mile an hour, flying about 38,000 feet, if you know what I mean by that, <laughs> just touching things. But what I'm doing basically in these noontime sessions or what I write about in this third book of mine uh, by the word of God. Uh, whenever I speak at a pastor's conference or something like that, I will encourage them to do what they I, exegetical studies go to the text and finds out what it's saying and stuff but how do you do that it's just flat out work studies show thyself proven to god a workman and needs not to be ashamed right dividing the word of truth it's work but it's a blessed work when people are especially called to preach and be in the ministry and teaching and equipping other saints <clears throat> this is the way to do this um, I've done this, what I'm going to be doing with the book of Jude. I've done with the book of 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, James, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, the book of Romans. One of these days I'm going to strap on Hebrews. And maybe even time stands, Revelations or something. Where you memorize, you meditate, you study, you look at words, just simple words. So Lord, help us. Now, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but do I have until a quarter to or to 1230? I cannot remember. Somebody help me. Where are you at? Greg, quarter two. Okay, if it's a quarter two, then if you have to get up and leave or any of that, I understand that. I will point you out. We will all look at you if you get out of your chair, okay? <clears throat> no, I won't do that. I promise I don't. Lord, help us to meet needs we don't even know we have in this brief uh, postcard. The book of Jude is just a postcard epistle. And the penman, what he has to say to us, to the church. It's a powerful, it is a hard-hitting, powerful little epistle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote the first seven verses. And if I make it through the first five, we'll do good because the next two, really, the first five as well, jumps into a subject that none of us want to hear. No preachers really want to preach on this. If they do, something's not right if you enjoy preaching hard on that subject. But nonetheless, it's part of the book and you have to, uh, it's part of the very character of God. But you have to do that. And that's what we'll emphasize tomorrow. So let me quote these to you. Jude, comma the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and call mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, for it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's the theme. I can't do that. I can't start talking yet. I've got to quote it. Um, verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained under this, condemn, under this condemnation ungodly men cha turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ I will therefore put you in remembrance though you once knew this that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. And the angels in like manner, who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner, giving, going... Going, you know, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Wow. That's all we want to try to look at today. In the last two verses, we may not, I, I doubt. Okay, we're going to get this. I'm just going to say a, a thing or two about these kinds of things. Jude, comma. We'll start out with first. Jude, he, the person who pens this letter, his name is Jude. But a comma is an interruption at an interval that requires emphasis. So you need to stop there and look back at the word Jude, the name, the, the penman, the guy who's writing this epistle. Who is he? We don't know much about him. In fact, he gives us his credentials in the next two comma statements. The servant of Jesus Christ. So this guy, Jude, has already made his decision in life. Who am I going to please? Because who you're going to serve is who you're going to please. And he says... Who I'm going to please in this life. In fact, he uses a guy at the end of his letter, toward the middle end of his letter. Enoch was a man who pleased God. So who you're going to please is who, you, who you're going to serve. 
And he'd made that decision. The Greek word is doulos. It means the guy who has the right now. He's fulfilled his employment obligation. He's earned his right. I don't know if this is bothering me or not, but sometimes I hear a little feedback. I'm going to move over here. Uh, this kind of a servant would say, I have the rights to leave the an employer now and go serve somebody else, or I can live off what I've made. But he would willingly go up to the doorpost and put his ear next to the doorpost, and the owner could mark him for life. This guy is a servant for life, no rights, no wages, no appeals. He wants to serve me. He's made a choice. I want to serve. So that's the kind of servant he was, the servant of Jesus Christ. He'd made his choice on who he was going to serve. You know what? If you just stop and ponder that for a few moments, every one of us in this room are serving someone. The great majority of my life and what I still struggle with the most is I want to serve or I want to please me. I want to be pleasing to me. I've spent a lot of my life and I'd like to say, no, I don't really want to really want to serve God. I want to please God. But the truth is I've spent most of my life wanting to please me. And the second is I want to please people. I'm a people pleaser. I don't want to be. I know, I know the futility of it, but I still have that. I want to be accepted by, I want to be applauded by man. Paul said it this way. Galatians chapter 1, I think it's verse 10. For do I now seek the favor of men or of God? By the way, these apostles will start their credentials. You'll see them again and again. Peter, James, Paul, all these guys say their name, the servant of Jesus Christ. The first thing they did, I want to let you know that I'm a servant. I want to please God with my life. Paul said, for do I, for do I now seek the favor of men or of God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. How many of you know sometimes it's easier to please God than it is to please men? Would somebody say men if you understood that at all? God's just easier to please than man is. How many of you know it's hard to please everybody? Say amen. It just is. And yet how much of my life I've spent trying to be a man pleaser. That he'd made his choice. And he uses, I think, one of his spiritual heroes, Enoch, because in Enoch, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch had made his choice. I, I, see, people, who you're going to serve is who you want to please with your life. And he had made that. So we know this much about Jude. He was wanting to please God with his life. He wanted to serve God. It sees them as synonyms. I want to serve God. It says the brother of James. He didn't say the brother of Jesus. How many of you know he could have said the half-brother of Jesus? Because that's who this guy is. The brother of James. We know that James is. Remember in Matthew 13, 55, it says... Jesus is ministering in his home province, Galilee and Nazareth in this area. And the Pharisees would look at him and said, how does this guy? They were astonished at his teaching, how, at his miracles. How does this guy, is this not the carpenter's son and his mother, Mary, whom we know, and his brethren, James and Ju Joseph and Simon and Jude or Judas? His name was Judas, but how do you know Judas Iscariot kind of slam dunked that name? Would you agree with that? Not, not too many people named their children judas anymore okay judah but not, and that's name was really from judah here he is his older brother is james who is the pillar he is the one in jerusalem that is leading the head elder apostolic leader of the church of jerusalem he said i'm just his brother does that tell us anything in john 7 it says when jesus is getting ready to go down to the feast of tabernacles or the feast of booths his brothers were not believers can you imagine growing up in the home with jesus how do you think we could just ponder there for a while? How do you know he was God? Say amen, would you please? I mean, he never did anything wrong. And you grew up in a home, and your oldest brother, what did they think about him? Especially when his ministry started, and he began to tell people he was a Messiah. I wonder if they were ever embarrassed over the fact that, aren't, aren't you that Jesus, that, that, the one that's going around saying he's the Messiah, aren't you his brother? Well, he's really a great guy, but the Messiah stuff, well, we don't really know about that. Do you know they show that's what shows up in there in John chapter 7? The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths was the second most popular feast for the Jewish people. It was six months after the Passover, so it was, the Passover was a big deal, okay? But that had a lot of blood and lambs and all this kind of stuff, the sacrifice, getting your sins taken care of. It was really a spiritual thing. But the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles was an absolute riot. They, it was remembering when they used to be in their tents. And there were campfires, and they set up tents all around Jerusalem. And the old men would tell stories to the children and the grandchildren. Guess what kind of stories they told them? Joshua. I even know every Jewish kid loved the story of Joshua. 
And they love them stories. Down the walls. <sighs> Took over 80% of the land. Occupied. Did what God told them to do. Joshua was, after that, Gideon. You think they like them stories of Gideon's? Wiping out the Midianites? How do you know them Jewish rabbis could really elaborate on them stories? And it was just an absolute right. So you know what? A majority of Jewish people came to the Feast of Tabernacles. And so what they say to Jesus in John chapter 7, his brothers say this to him. They came and said, listen, you want to make yourself known to the world? Now's the time to do it. The great majority of people be down at the feast. Why don't you go on down and tell them your stuff? They are not believers. I wonder if Jude now, a grown man, having lived life and knowing, coming to the place of who Jesus is, I want to be a servant. I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. He is my God. If he could look back over his shoulder and say, man, I wish I would have known then. Is there any of you here that look over your shoulder and say, I wish I would have known then what I know now about Jesus. Any of you there or not? I don't know about you, but I just relate to this guy right now. He just says that. Jude, I want to get this over. It's my only credentials. The only thing I say, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. The brother of James. He said, now I want to tell you who I'm writing to. To them. This is the group he's writing to. Scholars and other theologians say that his letter is probably written, uh, Scofia here says around 68. Most of them will say between 68, 70, or possibly as late as 80, 80. The church is worldwide. The other epistles have been written. Most of the apostles are dead. I mean, you know, he's not writing just to the Jews like James when he picked up the pen in 40 some 48 or something like, and wrote to the church. He wrote to the Jewish believers. I got news for you. The world, the, the churches went worldwide. Them apostles went to Spain, Europe, you name it. They went all over the world spreading the glorious gospel. Of Jesus. Asia, John, the churches of Asia, Paul, his missionary journeys. He's writing to them that are sanctified. Boy, if you were there Sunday morning, if you ever got what I was trying to say. The gospel is God's doing. I had nothing to do with it. And because of faith in what he has done for me, not what I ever have done, nothing will disqualify me, nothing will enable me. What he has done for me, my faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, I am sanctified. I am justified. I am glorified. I am complete in him. I am who he says I am. To them... By the way, this is rich and poor, white and black, young and old, male and female, Jew and Gentile, educated, illiterate. He's writing to a church worldwide. He's writing to people all over the world. This letter is to the church at large, to them that are sanctified. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified you are justified in the name of the lord jesus christ and by the spirit of our god see i i am washed can i tell you something my feet get dirty at times and if you know where i'm going with this or not remember peter jesus says i need to wash your feet and arrogant peter says you ain't washing my feet he said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. He said, then bathe me all over. He said, you don't need to bathe all over. You've already been bathed. That's what he's trying to say. In this whole world, we need our feet washed at times because we're going to walk through a dirty world. Would you agree with that? But I am sanctified. I am more than a conqueror. I am complete in him. It's something that God does for me. He's right with this. With this basic understanding, of what he's saying to them that are sanctified. It's not something I have done. God did this. He sanctified me. And we're going to be talking in our evening sessions about progressive sanctification. That's the feet stuff. But positionally before God, that can't improve on anything. And he's right into a church saying, I know you understand this. This is what the early church was taught. The foundation of who they were in Christ. You are sanctified. And then he says, and preserved. Preserved. In fact, we're sealed under the day of redemption. Would you agree with this? The Holy Spirit of God puts a seal on us. We're preserved in Colossians chapter 3, what is it, verses 3 and 4. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that when God, when Christ shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. Now, something I've done? No, something God does. He preserves me. We're sealed. My wife, I don't know if you did any canning this last year. I don't think you did, did you? Did you? 
Just some jelly, okay. But there's been times in our life when Joyce, is, when our kids was home, she's canning. We had a big garden, and she just canning stuff all the time. And you know what she used to love to hear? When she did night, you know, the last canning stuff, kids are in bed and stuff, she's taking the cans out of the can and setting them on the towel that's on the counter and stuff, whether beans or corn, whatever she's putting on there. And we go to bed, and we could hear the, the, the sound of the cans going, that's not a good imitation, but how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have canned and you know what I'm talking about? And you like to hear the seal. You, you know that baby, you know why? It's preserved. You can eat it a year later, two years, ten years later. I don't know about ten, but a lot later. You can. How many of you have eaten stuff that's been canned ten years? We have. You can. It's sealed. Can I tell you something? What he's writing to you that are sanctified and preserved in Jesus Christ. God put you in the can. Don't, don't preach that one too often, okay? But if you know what I'm trying to do with this. I believe I'm secure. See, if, my, if the security of my faith is dependent upon me, can I tell you something? I'd be breaking that can seal all the time. But I'm sealed. I'm in Jesus Christ. You're preserved. This is something that the church understood. He's writing to them. He said, this is the stuff you need to learn to contend for. Earnestly contend for these things. And preserved. Let me see here where we're at. In Jesus Christ and called. Now let's make this statement on called. (laughs) There's people who really go nuts on this. I'm not gonna. I'm nuts enough. I don't need to go nuts on this. I believe that there are people that are called and not saved. And I, but I don't believe there's anybody who's saved that's not been called. I'm going to say it again, and I don't want to play no mind games with you. But I believe that there's people that have been called that have not been saved. But I don't believe there's anybody that's been saved that hasn't been called. Let me give you just two verses. Today, if you will hear his voice, it's called. call. Harden not your heart, act of a will. Can you do it? I think you can. Called. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, and many other verses, who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. If you're saved, you had to hear the voice of God calling you and say, come on now. Come on. Holy Spirit's breathing in your ear and saying, you know this is true. And the battle's going on. You can remain dead. I think you can call you and say no. I think you can have a day of rejection. Now, you don't have to tear me up too bad on that. So you don't agree with that. That's okay. You're wrong. <laughs> Verse 2. By the way, I say it in some churches I'm in, and they're hot. I don't know how you're doing right now, but some of them really get lit up over that one. There's bigger fish to fry. There is a God in heaven who is overseeing everything. Did you know that? Now, here we go. Verse 2. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. Who's he saying that to? Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. Well, surely you got all that when you got saved. You don't need any need mercy. You don't need any peace. You don't need any love anymore after that. You just got it all when you got saved. Wrong. He's writing to those who are preserved, those who are called, those who are sanctified, and saying, you're not only going to need mercy, grace, and love to be saved. Can I tell you something? After you get saved, you're going to need it multiplied. You're going to need more of it. It's not something you just take a nibble of and say, yeah, I got all I need. No, you're going to need it on a daily basis, the mercy of God. How do you know that Christians, people who are sanctified, called, and preserved in Jesus Christ, have some turbulent times in their life? Would you say amen to that now? It's just, we're going to have them. Guess what we need to go through them? How about some peace? You can go in the storm. Jesus in the boat, you're doing exactly what he told you to do, going exactly where he told you to go. You couldn't be any more in the will of God than them guys in that. When them disciples were in that boat going to the place they were going to, they were doing what God wanted them to do. And a storm came up. Guess what Jesus spoke to the storm? Peace, be still. Guess what he'll do for you and I today in our storms of life? Peace, be still. Mercy, why do you need mercy? I'm going to talk about the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is God not doing to you something we deserve. I deserve justice. When I break the law, violate the character of God and who I am in Christ, can I tell you something? I deserve justice. Guess what I want? Mercy. Oh, Lord God, be merciful unto me. That's asking God to forgive me. I failed. The the sanctified, the preserved, and the called need mercy. And oh, how I need to know that he still loves me. Because I love people so many times when they're lovable. How many of you are glad I'm not God? 
How many of you know that God loved us when we were enemies of God, aliens in our minds by wicked works? Yet in his love, he, unto him who loveth us and hath washed us, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet pimps and prostitutes and drug addicts and haters of God and all, that's in there. The ungodly is one word that just covers us totally depraved people. And he loved us. Well, totally depraved people that get sanctified in Jesus Christ on occasion act depraved again. Anybody relating to this? Or is you let me take this one all alone? I know this is going to shock you, but even after I've been saved, I got angry one time. Just once. When my children failed me, I loved them, but you'd never know it by the way I treated them. They failed me. But what about when we fail our heavenly father, sanctified by God, the father? Did you know that God is everybody's God, but he's not everybody's father? God made everything, but not him without anything made with him. Everything God is, he is their God. God, the same God as the God of the Muslim, God of the Hindu. You go down to every religion, the atheist, he is their God. But he's only father to those who have received the son. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power, authority, become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. God, our fa- I can le- legitimately pray our father who art in heaven because he's my father. And my father treats me right when the son don't act like a son should. That's because he what? Loves me? Because I'm lovable? He loves me. God loves me. That's, what, that's, a, that's the second most unbelieved doctrine in the Bible, that God really loves us. Because we love the lovable. Because I can't love people with my human love, the way God loves me, I need his love to love people. God wants me to love people I don't even like. You let me take that one all alone or not? How do you know God saves some weird people? How about that one, all right? <laughs> They're not all like us. I mean, some strange-looking people, God saves them. He loves them. He says, now, I want you to... You want to know how to fulfill all the law and the commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I like the first one. The second one don't fit. Well, if I say I love him and don't love him, you know, I'm just kidding myself. Would you agree with this? This is the journey. This is what God calls us to do, the impossible, which is possible through the grace of God to do. I can do all. I can do this through grace. But without grace, I can pull it off on my best day. Something will happen that I'll come up short on. Now, anybody know where we're at? Verse 3. Beloved. I love this. Beloved, he says. When I gave all diligence to write unto you the commons salvation, I love this. If I ever started church and got a name for it, I would call it the commons. I'm not going to do that. I pray I don't have to do that. <laughs> it's fun to go into church and just <laughs> and leave. <laughs> church and pastors can't do that, okay? You've got to look at you, the same people next week. <laughs> I'm out of here in a few days. Okay. I shouldn't have said all those things. Here we go. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, I would name it the commons because it's a common salvation, it's a common faith, and the common people heard him gladly. Scriptures for all three of those. Common people. How many of you know that not many mighty, not many noble are called? Would you say amen to that? God goes to the common people. The Pharisees, educated, I mean, they, the wealthy, the, they had the influence, everything. Not many of them really got saved. But he went to the fishermen, the tax collectors. He said, the tax collector and the heart will enter the kingdom of God before you Pharisees will. How do you know that probably didn't set real well with that? He went to the common people who could recognize and see their need of something more than themselves to pull it off. The common salvation. He gave all diligence. When you're about the spiritual things, be diligent. If you're going to be sloppy in some things, make them some carnal, some temporal. But when it comes to the spiritual things, be diligent. That means undistracted. Give it your best. The spiritual stuff. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. Them that are sanctified and preserved in Christ Jesus, he says, I need to do this and exhort you. That means, come on. Rebuke means, stay back. Exhort means, come on, let's get after it. Let's get going. We need that. We need each other to do that with each other. I pray that some of that will even take place in these brief moments we have at lunchtime. Exhort you of the, that we should earnestly contend 
for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This is so significant. Don't miss this. Earnest. Earnestly contend. The word earnestly means with passion. You want to be passionate about something. You can see somebody that's passionate about something. I see some people passionate about things that really don't mean anything to me, but their passion is contagious. And I find myself sending in for their 1999, whatever it was they're trying to sell because they were passionate. <laughs> Did any of you follow that one at all? They're just passionate about it. I say, I don't need that. Who cares if you need it? He's passionate about it. Be passionate about it. I've been criticized for a lot of things. Lack of passion has never been one of them. That guy's a nutcase, but he's nuts about something. I want to be passionate. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Don't, don't put him in a half-human, half-angel freak condition. He was all human. And it said he prayed earnestly that it would not rain on the earth for the space of three and a half years. He didn't want a seven-year famine. He said three and a half years will do it. God would just shut the water off for three and a half years. And it rained not upon the earth for the space of three and a half years. And he prayed again that it would rain. And I got news for you. It was earnest again. It tells us seven times. Seven on the Jewish minds, a number of completions. It may have been 70 times. He said, I'm here till the rain comes. Got the servant standing out. He's in here on his ear. Oh, God, would you please send rain? It's been dry long enough. Send rain and let them know that you are God. Send rain. Hey, you see anything? He says, clear and dry. Second time, clear and dry. Third time, clear and dry. Fourth, gets to the seventh time. And he said, well, you know, I think I see a cloud about the size of a man's fist out on the horizon. He said, let's get out of here. It's going to rain. How you did not look at the one cloud we might have had here and grab your umbrella today. When you're praying earnestly, see, what he's talking about, he says, I'm doing this. I want, it, I want this to be contagious to you, that you would earnestly contend. The word contend means draw a line. Make a choice about what? The faith. Not your faith. Don't earnestly contend for your faith. Yours is feeble and so is mine. The faith. Singular, that the is a definite article, specific, singular, pointing toward one object. The faith. What is the faith? The faith that was once delivered unto the saints. This faith that was once delivered unto the saints. In Jude 20, just a few verses over, he says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. That's not what he's talking about, your most holy faith. Building yourself up in your most holy faith is your faith in the faith. There's a difference. You'll see that many times. Be it unto you according to your faith. Not be it unto you according to the faith. Your faith. Faith is something that can grow. A human's faith can grow stronger, and it should. Abraham's faith, can I tell you something? It got, it got weak at times. I even know that Hagar deal was a weak faith deal. But he got strong to the point where he said he was willing to take his son, his only son Isaac, whom he loved, take him up to a mountain that God had shown him, and there offer him a burnt sacrifice to God. That's strong faith. He didn't have that kind of faith when he was 75, but when he was 100, he had it. He was older than 100, probably 110, 15 years old. His faith grew. Our faith can grow. But the faith, the same God who gave him the faith, the promises that all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you, through you and Sarah. It got weak at times. And our faith gets weak. But what we need to get strong in is the faith. Let me give you some verses. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. As ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in, same word, the faith. What is the faith that you want to get rooted and established in? 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast means take a position. This is what I believe, and I'm standing in it. Stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men. You're going down, go down like a man, swinging. I'm sure that's in there. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Are you... What are, you, what are you living like right now? Is this in the faith? The faith? 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Some are going to leave the faith. Not their faith. They still have faith. They're just leaving the faith. Their faith in the faith. The faith. Simply said, it's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to get established in. That's something we need to just embrace again and again. Let me give you verse 5. Did I do four? No, I didn't. Let me do it real quick. Verse four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained under this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
just real short, who are before of old ordained. Some people lump that in with a called and that kind of stuff. Um, ordained before ordained means foreordained. They were set out for this purpose. That's what he's saying. How can I say it? Predetermined, predestined. Make it, let me make a comment between free will and predestination. By the way, those are irreconcilable differences. Some people say they can or choose one or choose the other. You can't do one or the other. They both are realities. I guess this has helped me as much as anything. It takes two oars in the water to go straight. If you jump on one, free will only, you pull, you get out in a boat someplace and you just pull on one oar. What do you do? You pull on the others. All you do is go around. If you want to go straight, you've got to have them both. Do I understand them? No, because they're irreconcilable. The will of man and, and the predestination of God, him before ordained, it's in there. We can't rip it out. I say this, Romans 11, 33, Oh, the depth, the riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? For of him and to him and through him. He's the source, he's the goal, and he's the means are all things. Let him be God. Isaiah 55, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, saith the Lord, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I can't think like God. He leaves me right here. I, with regard to Tom Harmon being saved, how do you know there's people who go up in the same home, brothers and sisters, and one be saved and one not one be saved, go through the same education, everything? I don't understand this. I believe God can call. I believe you can say no. If you say yes, you're the called. Here's how I, here's how I try to rationalize. I don't, I don't make it reconcilable as best I can. And I right now I'm talking about something that I cannot do. I can't, I can't shrink God to where I can understand it. And that's what our constant temptation and tendency is to reduce him down to say it's one or the other. It's both. In my inability to relieve the tension that exists between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, I've come to the place in my life where I believe that I was free to choose the destiny under which I was appointed before the foundations of the world. Did that go by? In other words, when I got saved, God didn't go, I never would have dreamed. Would you agree with that? <laughs> How you, we do that with one another. Would you agree with that? When people get saved, I'm surprised he got saved. Well, look in the mirror. Surprised any of us got saved. Would you agree with that? God said before the foundations of the world, I knew this. And I'm going, well, if you knew this, see, here's why I want to shrink him. Well, if you knew that, why'd you do this? How do you know God really doesn't have to answer our stupid questions? Would you agree with that? He is God and we are man. Don't erase the line that separate us. Let him be God. And live in the means that you say, no, I can. I got responsibility. I am responsible for my responses. I can't say I did it because God and his sovereignty didn't allow me to do it. Baloney. That's in Luke 75. Baloney. Now, enough said on that one. And we're just about done. No, we'll try the verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance of these things, though you know them. No, though, you, though you once knew this. That the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not. Boy, that's we're, we're getting ready to introduce a, a subject that's whew, heavy. The next two verses really drum roll it. I will, therefore, put you in a minute. It's an act of his will. He chooses. As Jude is writing this letter to them that are sanctified, church at large, he says, I will. This is my choice. I will, therefore, put you in remembrance. <laughs> remembrance. Don... When I saw you, I knew you, knew we'd work together, men's thing. And you said, I'll give you a buck if you can remember my name. And it, if, it was even, if I was even getting close, the pressure of one dollar sunk. I couldn't remember his name to save my neck. Any of you ever have that happen to you? You can't remember? This is making reference to a lifelong struggle for the Christian, for the sanctified, the called, and the preserved who are one of living for God, want to serve God. They struggle with remembering things they should know. We forget them. Peter said it this way, First Peter chapter, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12 through 14 says this, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and are already established in the present truth. Yea, I think it fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle, in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly. I, in other words, what I'm going to tell you, you already know. Paul said it this way, the church at Philippi, chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved brethren, to write the same things to you, Again, to me, indeed, is not irksome, but for you it is safe. He said, I really don't get tired of saying the same thing to you. When I do, it's safe for you. 
It is our lifelong struggle. I need to hear again and again. I got a call last week from a guy, Matt Martin. He's 48 years old. I actually know that about him. He, man, he thanked me for the book on grace, the book on grace. Now, our, two of our children said that's their second favorite book, the book on grace. Ellen wanted to take 20 of them to the class that she and Gabe are teaching in their church. She said, well, this, is, this is what I'm trying to say. This is what some of the people just don't get. You know, you have this impossible standard that I'm supposed to live. And when I fail, it's all, it's all me. Huh? There is grace. There's mercy and grace. But we're going to talk about how to appropriate this stuff to, to keep pressing on and growing in grace and the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Anyway, he said to me, he, our kids told me things that they read in the book. They're actually things that, that really blessed them. I thought, boy, that's good. I don't remember writing it, but that's good. And this guy, Matt Myron, called me and told me about something that had, he said, this is a life changer for me. He said, when I read that, he said, that, is, that just helped me again. He said, it wasn't that I didn't know it, it just helped me so much. And he told me what I said in the book. And to, to, for the life of me, I couldn't remember saying that. So I got out my book and read chapter three. And I said, boy, I, that did say that. That's really good. I couldn't even remember. And I wrote the book. <laughs> Any of you have that kind of problems in your journey? How have you been willing to look at your life and say, if I could only read? Sometimes you get things down. It's like there's certain times I'm saying, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready right now to meet you. And other times I'm saying, give me a little more time and get straightened up. How do you know what I mean by that? Because I'm strong in certain things at certain times. And it's usually the stuff that I'm bringing to my remembrance. I'm forcing myself to go back and review. I want to remember these things. I want to remember them. He says, you once knew this. How have you been willing to admit that there have been certain doctrines, certain truths that you have had down that were, you were living off and you were strong in. And then as time went on, you just kind of forgot about those truths and tried to pull it off again on your own strength. Any of you know what I'm trying to say with that? I just forgot. Him. I didn't do it intentionally. I need to be reminded. I need to be reminded again and again. Hmm. Close with this. I'd like to go to the next two. We'll, I'll take off and say them tomorrow and just you'll get the feel for it. If you're going to skip one, skip tomorrow. It's heavy. But come on Wednesday. Hallelujah. When we get to unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the never mind. come to that one. Okay. I hope you come tomorrow too. It's only going to be a 10 minute one. Here we go. Here's what he said. Having saved the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. You mean to tell me there were people that came through the Red Sea, the wonders of Egypt? Can you imagine that deal? It's dark in Egypt and light in Goshen, and there was a line that separated them. Can you imagine when the frogs and the f- flies and the you name it, all the things, the wonders of Egypt till finally the Passover, they went up the Red Sea, Red Sea parts, they cross across the Red Sea. How many of you think if you had one of them experiences, you would never doubt again? You would remember that for the rest of your life. Manna from heaven, tabernacle built, the glory of God, cloud by day, fire by night. It moves, we move. How many of you think if you had that kind of experience, you would never forget it? Any of you not? Or- did you leave? You're still here body wise. How do you know what I'm saying with this? He's talking to the Jewish people. He's saying about the need for remembrance. You once knew this. Here they are. He leads them up to Kadesh Barnea. You know where that's at? That is on the edge of the promised land that he says, I will give to you and your descendants forever. He said they forgot. All the wonders. By the way, you know who uses the word remember in the Bible more than anybody else? It is God. God says, remember what I did for you here. and Remember what I did for you there. But we have a tendency to forget. We forget those things. Two guys. Twelve. Spy out the land. Come back. Give the report. It's certainly the land that God said it was going to be. A land that flows milk and honey. Look at the grapes we got. And on and on and on. He said, we're getting fired up. Let's go. But 10 of them forgot and said, there's giants in the land. What's a giant when you can part the sea? What's a giant when you kill the firstborn of every house that isn't under the blood? What's a giant when he feeds you, when he builds a tabernacle for himself to dwell among you? What are the giants? And they forgot. You know what? When he reminded them, it was too late. And they said, we'll go now. When they read, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Because there was two guys that said, Joshua and Caleb, we are well able to take the land. Because they remembered. 
Oh, how I need to be reminded, how I need to have my memory jogged again and again of who God is because there's giants in my land. On my bulletproof vest, after I committed my life to Christ, I had my wife put on my bulletproof vest a picture of a great big giant that said, there's giants in the land. You can conquer giants because you are well able if you know who God is. And he's not a God to be toyed with. We are well able. Let's end on that note. Heavenly Father, would you take this avalanche and organize it in some way to speak to our hearts? Minister to needs we may not even know we have yet. I pray that you would be lifted up in our sight. That we would be reminded of who we are because of who you are and what you have done for us. Help us, dear God, to remind ourselves, be reminded of these basic, simple truths from Scripture. Would you begin to unpack, open up this little postcard to our hearts? May we feel like we're more familiar with things that the early church was given. 2,000 years ago, has it become old-fashioned in the 21st century? Is it no longer applicable now? Like our constitution of our nation doesn't apply to this generation. It's not true, dear God. Help us to embrace these old truths which were first delivered under the saints and then learn to contend for them, make our choices, choose our sides, become strong in you, and know that we are well able because of who you are. And we'll be careful to thank you and to praise you, for you are God, and there is none else. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sitting, listening intently, okay? You're dismissed.